Good morning. There we go. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Heartland Church. So glad you guys made it. Let's go ahead and stand, and we'll get going with some songs. Your love, oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the skies. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountain. Your justice flows like the ocean's tide. And I will lift my voice to worship you, my King. And I will find my strength in the shadow of your wings. Your to the heavens, your faithfulness stretches to the sky, your righteousness is like the mighty mountain, your justice flows like the ocean's tide. And I will lift my voice to worship you, my King. And I will find my strength in the shadow of your wings. And I will lift my voice to worship you, my King. And I will find my strength in the shadow of your wings. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Heartland Church. It's so good to be here this morning. And, uh, you know, we just sang this song, The Steadfast Love of the Lord Never Ceases. And that actually comes from the book of Lamentations, uh, which is a very encouraging book. Um, <laughs> 
or discouraging book, depending on how you look at it. But it's actually a very encouraging book because the writer's going through so much. And that book is about the destruction of Jerusalem. And, you know, he, he's watching everything that they held dear fall apart and be destroyed. And, and you know, in the midst of just kind of going through his woes, he, he writes this, these words. In, in Lamentations 3, verses 22 through 24, he says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. And that's true. No matter what we're going through, no matter how good things are going or how bad things are going or or awful, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. You know, if you're here this morning alive, it's because of God's mercy. What we deserve is not to be here, not to be a part of a family like this, not to be God's children, but his mercy never ceases, never comes to an end. They are new every morning. One thing I love about God is he's a God of new starts. And God designed things in that way. You know, we have a New Year celebration, and it's like, oh, New Year, we make resolutions, and we never do them, but we do it anyway, and it's a new year. But but every month, we get a fresh start. Every week, every Sunday is a fresh start. And and really, every morning when the sun comes up, it's a new start from God. Great is thy faithfulness. You know, even when we're not faithful to God, he is faithful to us. His faithfulness is so great. He never is unfaithful to us. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. You know, we get daily sustenance from God. If we had nothing else, and in America, we have a lot, right? We have, a, we have an abundance. We have things we don't need. We have storage of stuff that we don't need, right? But, but really, God is our portion. What we really need every day, we get from God and then the, he, the final thing he says in this chapter, or this verse is, therefore, I will hope in him. And again, I just want to encourage you this morning that no matter what, no matter how good things are going, no matter how not good things are going, God is your hope. Amen. We hope in him. He is our portion. His faithfulness is great. He is new every morning. His mercies never come to an end. In fact, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Yeah. Amen. But we're going to shift gears here a little bit. Um, If you don't know us, some of you guys don't know us, my name is Tim Schmidt, and this is my wife, Crystal. And we get the honor and privilege to serve here in the church, on on the staff here. And uh, But we've been gone a little bit, if you didn't notice. And um, I told someone earlier, actually, every Monday we've been here. I don't know where you guys were. We were here every Monday and, and couldn't find you. But... But um, anyway, we just want to, uh, uh, we're so grateful to be back. Crystal's yeah. going to share a little bit in a minute. But before she gets into that, I did want to point out one important fact that while we were gone, the Razorbacks were undefeated. <laughs> we came back, and I don't know what happened. So blame us if you want. I'm sorry. Maybe we, we need to leave again. I don't know. But uh, I'll let Crystal share a little bit now. That was sad. It really was. <laughs> So we are so happy to be back, and I just wanted to share, we were welcomed by a gift basket back, and I know you all know that, but we are so grateful just for the love that was poured into us, and uh, we started reading through the cards when we got home. We had our staff meeting with the Werners on, and KP on um, Friday, and then um, they gave us the gift basket, which it was so encouraging to be welcomed back with so much love, and then we just sat there and read through the cards, and it was so special to us. So we, were so, we felt so loved. We we're so grateful to be able to get that and to read through those and just your hearts. We're so grateful for each one of you, and uh, we're just really, really happy to be back. It was hard for me to be gone for three months, but uh, it was a great time. We did get a lot of rest. You know, life is still life. Things still happen. Uh, you guys all know JT was in a bad accident, and it, it's all good, but we got a lot of rest in the meantime, and uh, we're just grateful. We're so grateful for each one of you. We're grateful to be back, and Tim's going to share a little bit more. Yeah, with the cards, too, that you guys wrote for us, um, especially the kids' cards were just super, uh, super impacting, and sorry, getting a little emotional here, but uh, we just felt so much love from you guys, and, and even the fact that you allowed us and, and sent us to go and do this, um, it, it's just so, we felt so much love and support from, from you guys, and of course, we want to be that for you guys as well, and so it's, we just love the family here. Um, we look forward to, in, in the weeks and months to come, just sharing a lot of things that we learned, some of the things we did. We're not going to do it all today because that was three months worth of stuff. But, um, but anyway, we are so grateful to be back and just look forward to uh, building more family here with you guys. Okay, I'm going to pray for us right now.
Um, so if you could bow your heads. Father, thank you so much just for this chance to be here this morning, God. Thank you for every face that is here, every body that is here, God. We're so grateful to be able to come together and worship you collectively, Father. We're so grateful that we get to worship an amazing, perfect Father. Thank you for being that for us. Thank you for your steadfast love, the hope you give us, the mercies that are new every morning, Father. We love you so much, and we pray that um, we just honor you with our lives today. We love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, a couple quick things, because it's time for announcements. I was like, sure, I'll do announcements. I have no idea what's been going on, but I'll do announcements. So um, I'm so grateful just for uh, all the fun things that are coming up, because I was like, wow, we have we have a lot coming up. So um, just wanted to remind you, our midweek schedule will be men this week, and then women the following week. So men's midweek here at the building, 7 o'clock on Wednesday. And then next weekend is the church camping trip. So I know a lot of people are excited about that. Um, with that, I just wanted to let you know that for the ones who are camping, our church service will be Saturday night at 6 p.m. at the campground. There'll still be church service here on Sunday morning, so everything's still the same. But while we're at the campground, we want to be respectful of people on Sunday mornings and not wake everybody up by worshiping God so loudly. So we are going to do that at 6 p.m. at the campground, um, and that will be great. If you have any questions about the camping, ask Laura. Um, she knows it all with camping. So, um, and then the following weekend, I just wanted to talk about this real quick. The teens and preteens will be meeting at Farmland Adventures from 2 to 6. There'll be a lot of fun activities to do. Um, the overall cost is $14 per person, and you need to make sure you RSVP to Laura by the 13th. They do have to have a count. So if you can please RSVP to Laura by the 13th, again, $14 a person. If you have any other questions, you can ask her, Scott, about that as well. Uh, there's a few other announcements on here, so make sure you have a look at that. And then I just wanted to point out one prayer request for Becky. She is back home, and she's healing. Um, so just continue to pray for her surgery to heal. And I know there's a lot more to pray for and a lot of people hurting, so just continue to pray for those that you know are going through things. Um, again, just for our health care workers. I'm so grateful you guys were on my heart a lot <laughs> while we were gone. Um, I know you guys just deal with a lot being in the medical field. So just continue to lift them up in prayer on a daily basis. And, um, yeah, so that's it for announcements. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to continue singing this morning. Hold you, the 
be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Nice. <laughs> so now I'm 
I'm going to take a second and talk about our offering, our contribution. Uh, so in the back, we have two chalices. And so whenever you are ready, you can write an envelope and put it in those. If you want to give online, the information to do so is on the announcement sheets. Bow your heads and we pray. Dearly Father, I just want to come to you in prayer this morning and say thank you for a beautiful Sunday. Thank you for this opportunity to just learn more about you and grow as disciples, Lord. And I'm so grateful for just all the good that you've blessed us with, with the ability to even give to your kingdom. Uh, I just pray that we can have our hearts be in a place of, of giving and of love so that we can show the world the same love that you showed us. And so I pray that in our giving, that your kingdom can be strengthened and that our hearts can be renewed towards you and directed toward you and that we can keep you a priority with all that you bless us with, Lord. For us in your heavenly name, amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. I am double honored this morning uh, because if you've noticed, we haven't actually had communion yet. And so I am in charge of communion, and I'm also in charge of the sermon. So you may call it a sermunion or a kermumin, 
or curmudgeon something. So I'm in charge of it, whatever it's called. And I just am so honored to get to our, lead our, our thoughts, our hearts towards Jesus this morning. So our, our lesson is really going to be geared towards remembering who Jesus is, who he was, what he did, what he is doing, uh, and just focusing our hearts on him. And then after uh, I, I talk for not too long, hopefully, by prayer, right, uh, we, we will take communion together, okay? So we're going to be in Isaiah 53. This is a really interesting passage here. We're not going to read all of it, but this is such a cool scripture. It's this really incredible time that we get to see written probably 500 plus years before Jesus came about Jesus, which is really interesting, really incredible. And this, in fact, was the passage that was being read by the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, where uh, Philip, of course, runs up and he's like, how am I supposed to understand this when I don't have anybody to explain it? And he starts with this passage and it ends with this guy getting baptized, right? An incredible moment and there's something really special, a lot of things really special housed within these these words. So let's start in verse 4. It says, Surely... Don't call me Shirley. No. Uh, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had, not, he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. What a powerful scripture here. What a powerful passage that was written so long before Jesus ever went to the cross. This just goes to show us how deeply God truly loved us. That he knew that Jesus would suffer and die for each and every one of us in this room and beyond. Right? That everybody that reads these words would be able to to dwell together in this same fact that Jesus died for them. Jesus suffered for them. And there's something in particular, I don't know about you, but for me, that really sticks out in this. And this is verse 7, right? He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. And I think that that's powerful. It's, and it's so interesting to me because why didn't he open his mouth? Why, when all of this stuff was happening to him when he was bearing the load, the weight of each and every one of us on earth, let alone in this room, how on earth could he be silent? How could he manage to find silence in those times? And if you read through the different gospel accounts, they talk about this same idea. Right? That he is beset upon by, by these people and they ask him these questions. They're like, if you are the son of God, do this or say this. And he is silent. And my question this morning is why? Why would he choose to be silent? Why did he go out of his way to, to be oppressed and afflicted and yet not open his mouth? I believe his silence spoke more than his words ever could. And that is why he chose to be silent. 
And so our sermon today, this morning, is going to be focused on this idea, the sound of silence. We're not going to play the song, all right, but hopefully you probably already know it, amen. I believe his silence speaks volumes, and we're going to look at a few accounts leading up to Jesus' death. Leading up to his crucifixion, the moments before it happened, okay? And we're going to see three different things that I believe his silence really spoke volumes to. Are you guys with me? The first is to his submission. His silence really showed his submission. In Matthew chapter 26, it reads, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus shows here his heart of submission. That in this moment, he cries out in the garden to God. He cries out because he's afraid of what's going to happen. Imagine that Jesus is not looking forward to being tortured and killed in the worst way in human history. Right? I know I wouldn't, right? I, I'd, be, I'd be feeling great about it. No. Right? Jesus is going through the most difficult time in his life. And so what does he do? He cries out to God. He bows before him and says, Father, please, anything but this. If it's possible, take this cup from me. What a... a vulnerable position for Jesus to be in. That he cries out to God, just laying it at his feet, the troubles, the sorrow, everything that he's experiencing and feeling, he lays before God and says, please handle it. Please, some other way, there must be something else that could happen. And of course, he got his answer, that there wasn't any other way. And in this moment we see him bear his soul to God. And then as we look forward to him refusing to answer, as people say, if you are the son of God, make this be done. Make it go away. Make it so you don't have to suffer anymore. And yet he's silent. What this shows is that he was truly submissive to God. That he submitted to God's will. This Final line that he says, yet not as I will, but as you will, rang true in his silence. That as he bared the weight of your sin, he chose to be silent because he was submitting to God. How about you? Have you submitted to God's will this morning? Have you submitted to God's will in your life? To be honest, it's pretty easy, quote unquote, to submit to God's will at church every Sunday morning, right? Maybe it's a bit of a struggle waking up in the morning. Uh, Somebody, I'm not going to name names, was like 15 minutes late to our practice this morning. Um, But he's been recovering from some stuff. I don't want to talk about it, but uh, (laughs) it can be hard to wake up, amen? But once you're here, it's pretty easy to be submitting to God. You know, the, the person up here often uh, is, is a better speaker than me and sounds really great. And so, oh, it's really easy to listen to that person, right? It's easy to sit here and, and oh, yeah, that sounds great. That sounds so good. Amen. But what about Monday? What about Sunday afternoon, right? Sometimes it's that fast <laughs> that it goes. For me, I'm speaking from experience here, right? Guys, we need to live submitted to God. That no matter what's going on, no matter what's happening, just like what Tim and Crystal were sharing in the welcome, no matter what's going on, God has your best interest in mind. And so what do we do? We submit to him. We submit 
everything that's happening, put it before him, but we say, not as I will, but as you will. Maybe the cup in your life feels unbearable. I'm sure it felt like that to Jesus too. And yet, as he laid it before God and things still didn't go the way he asked, he submitted. And that is our challenge this morning as well. That even as we go through difficult times, we have a cup before us in our life that we feel like we can't manage, that it's unbearable, insurmountable, let's look to Jesus and how he chose in his silence to truly submit to God. I love back in this scripture, I'm going to back up, in Isaiah, it says, we all like sheep have gone astray, and then it likens Jesus to a sheep as well, right? He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. We're going to be like sheep one way or the other. Either you're going to be the sheep that wanders off and is all by themselves, with no protection, no security, kind of doing your own thing. Or we can be the sheep that's submissive, the sheep that listens to the shepherd that obeys what the shepherd calls us to do. Amen? That is the type of sheep that Jesus chose to be. And I feel like our world nowadays uses the word sheep in a negative context. And amen, there's a negative connotation, right? Sheep aren't the smartest of animals, okay? But following the right thing is good, right? Just blindly following anything Okay, that's not so good. But choosing to follow God, that's the good kind of being a sheep. And now I'm not saying well, follow everything I'm saying, right? Don't follow me in this. Follow God. Obey him, what he's calling you to do. And as we read scripture, we look at what it is God's calling us to do. But don't follow me. Don't follow just whoever's up here or whoever is speaking at the moment. Follow Jesus. Follow God. Submit to his will. Do everything you can to figure that out. And amen, it's not blindly following because we know how incredible God is. We've seen him do such amazing things in the lives of others around us, in our own lives, and in the scriptures. We see time and time again that the steadfast love of the Lord is never failing. So that's why we follow. But that doesn't mean you're always going to get the full picture. And so, in a sense, it's blind because you don't exactly know where God's taking you. But it's worth following because God has your best interest in mind. And he loves and cherishes you. And so, of course, like Jesus, we choose to submit. Now, if we fast forward just a few verses, we see the second thing I believe that his silence really speaks to, and that's his resolve. Down in verse 50, it says, Jesus replied, do what you came for, friend. This is his answer as Judas comes to him and kisses him as a sign of who the Messiah Jesus was so that they could arrest him. What a tough moment for Jesus, that one of his best friends, this, this man who's been around him, loved by him, poured out from Jesus to this guy for three plus years. And he's betraying him with a kiss. And Jesus replies, do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? This shows 
And every moment here on out through Jesus' execution that he truly was rooted in his resolve. Now this idea of a legion of angels, just one, a legion was somewhere between five and 6,000 Roman soldiers, right? They had different sizes of potential battalions, stuff like that. This is the largest, five to 6,000 soldiers, which means 12 legions, if we do quick math, is 60 to 72,000 angels. That's a lot, right? And it it took like one angel, like no time at all to wreck an entire army. So what Jesus is saying here is he could handle it in the blink of an eye at just a word to God. And this would be done like that. And yet... As he was pierced for your transgressions, as he was tortured and killed, he remained silent. This truly speaks to his resolve. Why was he there? Right? Verse 54 tells us. He says, don't you think I can put 12 legions of angels like that? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled? that say it must happen in this way. Every moment that Jesus chose to be silent, chose to be completely quiet instead of calling down 72,000 angels to deal with his problems, right? Every moment was because he was thinking about you. Because he knew that this was the only way you could dwell with him for eternity. That if he really went through with this, that you had a chance to be with him and God forever. And so he chooses to keep his mouth shut. Jesus had his eyes on the prize, right? Every moment, his body wanted nothing more than for him to scream out, to just put an end to the suffering, to the difficulty, to the pain, and he chose Every moment, each and every one, no. I'm doing this for a reason. At the forefront of his mind was not the pain and suffering he was going through. It was you. He was there because your sins put him there. And he wanted nothing more than to save and protect you from the pain that those sins were going to inflict on you for all of eternity. He was willing to go to the cross because of you and was resolved every moment in silence that he would suffer and bear the weight so you didn't have to. This time that we are going to have here in a a few minutes of communion is only attainable because of Jesus' sacrifice. The idea of communing with God Without Jesus is impossible. Something that strictly cannot be. Because God can't be around sin. He just can't. It's not in his character to be capable of being around sin. And so when you still have a price to be paid, he can't be with you. And so what does Jesus do? He pays the price. In complete silence, in obedience and resolve, he chooses to pay the price so you can have this moment of communion. So when we take the bread and the cup in a little bit, keep that in mind. That the only possible way that you could dwell with God in any capacity is because of Jesus and his sacrifice. Because of Jesus choosing to remain silent. Amen? Man, this time of communion we do every week is is so crucial because it's so important for the way that we live our lives to really hold that close. Which brings us to our third and final point here, that his silence demands a response. In Luke 19, just a week before all of this stuff went down, we see just such a, a point as this. 
It says, as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. This is a pretty stark contrast to one week later, right? What do they say? Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Jesus, every moment he chose to be silent, was a moment where he was begging you for a response. Begging for the outcry that should come from a humble, innocent man choosing to die. Choosing to suffer on your account. And yet, according to Isaiah, who protested? Who in his generation protested? No one. Don't let that be us as well. That as Jesus suffered and died and left so much space of silence, it's begging for the space to be filled. That he begs each and every moment that he was struck or wounded or what have you, that he remained silent, begged for some kind of outcry. And that something that needs to fill the space is what our heart yearns for. Every time we think about Jesus going through this and being silent completely, our heart yearns for just somebody, cry out something, anything. And that something must be you. That it's not somebody else's job to respond and fill the silence and the void of what Jesus left. That's for you to fill. For you to decide to respond to what it is that Jesus did. To respond to how he suffered, to what sacrifice he truly went to. It's up to us. Each and every one of us in this room, watching online, you name it. It's up to us to respond. To fill the silence. There's a reason that when there's silence, we want to we fill the space, right? It's, it's awkward. It's uncomfortable. And imagine dying in such a way as that. Going through everything he went through would have been so uncomfortably silent. Because he is begging you to do something. Begging you to be more than you are. To push yourself to, to be uncomfortable and fill the silence that he leaves with outcries of who he truly is. Not simply us crying out with our voices, but with our hearts, with our lives, and the way that we choose to live it each and every day. We need to continually be responding to what Jesus has done for each and every one of us. That our lives need to be characterized by filling the silence with a response. And choosing to love Jesus and love others and do everything we can so that Jesus' silence can speak louder than his words ever could. The capability of Jesus crying out in his death and silence lies in you. Choosing to respond the appropriate way or not. Because it is a choice, and he has left that choice up to you. We're going to go back through Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 9. And I want us to really think about these three aspects and how they ring true in his silence even to this day. Starting in verse 4, it says, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. There's the resolve. 
We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. There's the submission. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? There's the response. For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. This scripture as well as the very silence of Jesus, speaks to this day. Let's allow Jesus and his choice to be silent stir within us. Stir within us submission to God, no matter what the situation. Stir in us resolve for others that we want to make sacrifices just like Jesus did too, so other people can experience the communion that we get to experience today. And finally, that we get to stir within us a response with the way that we live our lives. This truly is the sound of Jesus' silence. To God be the glory. At this time, we are, you guessed it, going to take communion. And so, since the, the title is Sound of Silence, I thought it'd be appropriate for us to give 30 seconds, a minute, somewhere in there of silence. Okay? So, I'm going to pray for our communion here. The singers are going to come up, come to their places, but we're just going to have silence for a time. All right? Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we are eternally grateful for your sacrifice, for your choice to remain silent despite everything that was going on, despite the affliction, the suffering, everything, Father, you chose, your son chose to die for us. You chose to send him to die for us, that that was your will, that we could have these times of communion with you. And Father, I pray we can truly live out what Jesus did here every day. And that we can see the needs that we have for others, the needs we have in our own life for just being close to you. And that we can truly act on those things. We love you so much. And I pray we can really come to grips with what your silence meant. We love you. Pray all this in your son's name. Amen.
Thank you, Josh, for that great lesson this morning. And, uh, you know, I want to encourage us. We're going to sing one more song together in just a moment. <clears throat> but I want to encourage us as we sing this song, it really is a song of response. And we're going to sing, Here Am I, Send Me. And so as we sing this, sometimes we sing songs and we've sang them so many times, we're just kind of singing through it. But, but really think about these words and really make this a, a prayer of response for you. And I want to encourage all of us this week to, to think of how are we going to respond in our lives. Josh mentioned, you know, it's easy to, on Sundays to do it here. But how are we going to do it this afternoon? How are we going to do it tomorrow throughout the week? Really live a life for God. So let's stand. We're going to sing Here Am I, Send Me. And uh, then we'll be dismissed. There is much to do, there's work on every hand. Hark the cry for help comes ringing through the land. Jesus calls the reapers, I must act to be. Ready at thy bidding, here am I, send me. Here am I, Lord. There are hungry souls who cry aloud for bread. With the bread of life, they're longing to be fed. Shall they stop and vanish while the feast is free? I must be more faithful. Here am I, send me. Here am I, Lord. souls who linger on the brink of woe. Lord, I must not, cannot, better let them go. Let me go and tell them, brother, turn and flee. Master, I would save them. Here am I, send me. Here am I, Lord, here am I.
dismissed.